This is Daryl from Pennsylvania. When I'm not busy arguing with a four-year-old, I'm stacking Benjamins. No, Daddy! Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's the Stacking Benjamin Show. And today is National Senior Citizens Day. Oh my God, there's so many potential jokes about Joe. I'm just, I don't even know where to start. But what that really means is that Joe's mom rode her Harley down to the bowling alley and now we got the basement all to ourselves. So, of course, that means we've invited award-winning blogger Len Penzo down to the basement before he talks inflation in the most fun possible way by closely examining the cost of a sandwich, we'll share a headline about 10 stocks millennials can't live without. Surprisingly, Budweiser didn't make that list. We'll also throw out the Haven Lifeline to a lucky caller, and then, to show we're really rocking the basement, I'll share my incredible trivia. And now, two old guys who really rock a mean turkey in Swiss... It's Joe and oh, j j j j g Turkey and Swiss is good, but the old guy comment, I think age is just a number, OG. Age is One just of us a number. Is celebrating National Senior Citizens Day today. Is that you? Congratulations, man. Congratulations. <laughs> I think I got a little ways to catch you. <laughs> uh, Still working on it. I know I am, but what are you? Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Stacky Benjamin Show. I am Joe Salci. I average Joe money on Twitter and across the card table from me as surly as ever. It is Mr. OG. Turkey sandwiches, huh? Sometimes I go back and forth. Ham, turkey. Turkey and Swiss, though. Bologna. In the right mood. I haven't had bologna in forever. Cheryl, Cheryl doesn't let us eat it because it's so salty. She's like, uh, no bologna. I'm like, are you crazy? I grew up on bologna. Look at all this. Is made from bologna. All this. Yeah, you can tell. Hard, 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 hard to believe, isn't it? I should transition out of that thing. Uh, big thanks to, I, I don't even, I don't even have a transition today. Okay, just guys, gears. just Got live it. with it. Live with the fact, no transition today. We're just moving into Acre Trader. Big thanks to Acre Trader for supporting Stacky Benjamins. For more information on how to become a farmland investor through Acre Trader, visit acretrader.com forward slash SB. They have a great explainer video, OG, that explains what it's all about. We'll explain what today's about. Today, Len Penzo in the basement. If you haven't listened to the show for very long. Who's that? I think, who is this Penzo guy? Uh, Len, every year, visits the basement with his annual sandwich survey. And there's no more fun way to talk about inflation than talking about the price of a school lunch. And Len's bringing it again today. But first, we've got a couple headlines. We got some crazy headlines. So let's get this party started. Hello, darlings. And now it's time for your favorite part of the show, our stacking Benjamin's headlines. Uh, first up in uh, ring number one of this circus that's the Stacky Benjamin show is uh, this one from Investment News and Mr. Jeff Benjamin. Ten stocks millennials can't live without. And when I saw that, I went... Sure, I'll jump on the clickbait. That's exactly what I said. No, no, don't. I can't. I can't. Oh, I clicked it. Uh, yeah. An analysis of 658,000 investment accounts held by millennials ranks the top 100 favorite stocks based on the percentage of overall portfolio holdings. It's clear millennials as a group are poised to become the largest generation. They put their money where they're most familiar. Following are the top 10, according to Apex Clearing. Who do you think is in the top 10 stocks that millennials absolutely love? Then we'll talk Apple, about this. Amazon, Netflix, Facebook, Impossible Burger. We start off at number 10 with Disney. Okay. 2% of portfolios hold it. That number, by the way, is way up since March. From March to June, it went from 17th to 10th. So far this year, as of the time that we recorded this, it's only up 30%. So, you know, not that great. Next up, and please don't go buy these. When you hear that a stock is up 30%, please don't go buy it for that reason. Uh, but that's when I want to buy it. We're going to get back into that. Number nine, Microsoft. 
Okay. I think it's interesting, you know, ever since Microsoft changed CEOs, the stock's gone in the right way. But I think it has more to do with the fact that once they hired uh, a member of my bloodline, that all of a sudden, Mike, did, oh, have, have that's you noticed that? Took off? I, I think that's probably it. I think it has much more to do with somebody in the Salsi High family working in Redmond that they finally righted that ship. You're welcome. It has, it has gone up quite a bit lately. You're welcome, Microsoft. Yeah. We won't talk about when Nick got hired versus when the stock started going up because that might change my whole theory there. But I'm just throwing it out there. Conspiracy yeah. theories, you know. All right. All right. Uh, AMD, Advanced Micro Devices. Hmm. Okay. That's one that I used to hear a lot, you know, around 2000, 2002 a ton. And then a little bit after that. But so I'm, I'm kind of, you, you surprised to see that one here? I haven't heard it. So, Yeah. Kind of surprised. Here you go. Netflix at number seven. Next up, Berkshire Hathaway. Okay. Number six. Uh, clocking in at number five is Alibaba. Isn't Alibaba the genie in Aladdin? <laughs> oh, it's the, uh, okay. Something different. The genie in your portfolio. The uh, Apparently it the is. Christina Aguilera song. Up that's, what it was, that's what it was made about. Up 60. Alibaba, Alibaba stock. <laughs> that's, that's why it was a hit song because it's all about that's right. stocks that's right yep <laughs> you know you got a hit on your hand when it's about the rule of 72 like <laughs> oh man it's coming around now number four is facebook nice work okay. there had that one yeah yep you're nailing the top ones here number three is of course tesla did you say tesla oh i didn't no, no. didn't no. think about tesla yeah shoot yeah could add that of course that stock's only down 25 percent so far this year and then number two is apple okay had that one which means number one did you say number one i'm not sure what Am is it amazon uh, I can't remember. Amazon. I'm not paying attention. I want to talk about this though. So there's our top 10, but I want to talk about that because of the fact that I looked at this article and what was the first thing you thought when I even brought this to the table? Clickbait. And the second thing about portfolios or portfolio construction or anything around that? Oh, uh, you probably don't need to have individual stocks. Correct. Been the major part of that. <laughs> Yes. You see these people that say, but I'm not an investor because I don't have individual stocks. If you have a 401k at work, if you have an IRA, you're an investor and you don't need any of this stuff. And this clickbait is all over the place. Oh, everybody else owns it. I mean, the whole headline here, OG, is written on FOMO, right? The, the fear of missing out. Oh, it's up 30%. I mean, wouldn't it be nice if you guys would have had that? You might want to get the next 30. Just saying. Yeah. And then also what somebody else does for their portfolio means nothing to you. You've got your own goals. Yeah. Set it up based on your own goals, not based on what somebody else is doing, OG. I think all that individual stocks are are like a gateway drug because it's a gateway drug to market timing. All you're going to do is look at the price of those stocks. It's just going to cause that angst. And you're going to go, oh, it's down since I bought it, but this other one's up. Oh, shoot. All right, I picked the wrong one. Just this time, I'm going to fix that. I'm down 2% in my Amazon stock. So, yeah, they probably were at a peak. And okay, that's way. Yeah, I'm going to go. I'm, I'm going to take the money out of Amazon. I'm going to buy Microsoft. That's what I should have done to begin with. All that's going to happen is you're just going to find yourself day trading away your life. And um, it's a gateway drug. Don't Pe do it. People who know me including you know that I like individual stocks. I think individual stocks are a ton of fun. It's less than 5% of my investment portfolio. It also is a piece of my portfolio that I don't really count on to make things happen. I'm not really right. worried about it's it. It's totally fun money. It is way, and it is way fun. It is incredibly fun to trade individual stocks, but I'm with you it, that the whole gateway thing, it's a slippery slope into uh into individual stock land. If you do it, put that money in a side account and just have some fun with your sandbox money. And there's people that I've run into who go, well, you shouldn't have any sandbox money because it all counts toward your net worth. Okay, I get it. If I'm trying to optimize every single piece of my life, Tim Ferriss, I will <laughs> I'll, I'll, then maybe. 
However, there's a piece I don't want to optimize. If I optimized everything, I wouldn't waste my time playing fantasy baseball where I'm seventh out of eight. Wasted my entire <laughs> summer on that thing. My team finally climbs up to fifth place and I get beat like 10 to two. And then I go uh, back to the cellar. I have finally you given have, up. Do you have the Reds? I have guys on every different team. You know, you pick individual players. I know how it works. It was a joke on the Cincinnati Reds are sucking. Oh, and... yeah. No, I could have the Detroit Tigers. I am oh. the Detroit. No, 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 no. I take that back. I'm in seventh. I'm not in last. <laughs> <laughs> I might have the Reds. So there you go. All right. Uh, I think we beat up that piece enough. Nice. Individual stocks, fine. Don't yeah. count on them. And uh, clickbait article about what everybody else is buying. Neato. Nothing to do with you. Our second piece comes to us from Seeking Alpha. I hadn't thought about this. <laughs> wow. Seeking really, Alpha, really by the way, deep. for people that have no idea why OG is laughing, it's a place where individual stock traders go <laughs> to talk right. about increasing awesome their returns. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, this is written by Brad Thomas, but this is an asset class I'd never thought of. So for those of you who are new to this investing thing, Asset classes are different categories of investment. So you've got, you know, um, small cap, large cap, mid cap. Those are small size companies, mid sized companies, big companies. You also have real estate, utilities. Um, you've you've all different type of technology stocks, healthcare stocks. You've all these different ways that investment professionals slice and dice the universe so that they compare things to each other. This is an asset class I'd never considered. Brad writes, small cap REITs are hard to beat. I had never thought about real estate investment trust in terms of capitalization, in terms of small, medium, and big real estate firms. Had you? I hadn't heard of it, no. Yeah. Makes sense, I guess. It, REITs are good. Small caps are good. Yeah. Let me get small cap REITs. I know. I saw this and I went, okay, at the risk of making OG laugh, which, bam, cross that off your bingo card. I, uh, I I came up with something. I was a financial planner for 16 years, been doing financial media for 10. Small cap REIT. I'm like, oh, that's, that's pretty cool. Is there like one fund that does it? The small cap REIT portfolio has returned about 23% year to date. Uh, since inception the small cap REIT portfolio has outperformed the Vanguard real estate ETF by almost four times, 37.7 compared with 9.3. What's inception time? I mean, I could beat Usain Bolt in a hundred meter dash, depending on the inception date of my race. It's, it's, it's four days ago. <laughs> like if I start at the 90 meter mark and he starts at the zero meter mark, I got a decent chance of beating him, I think, by four times. That would be a fun game, like taking pro athletes and finding like exactly how much better they are than everybody else. So like a really good 40 year old athlete versus Usain Bolt in the hundred meter dash. Like he's got to run the hundred and I get to run it from like 30 yards and he still beats me, you know, type of deal. Like how far, like exactly how much better is, is, is he than the right. rest of the, yeah. the average man? You know? uh, the answer White here, race, the answer here, by the way, is that there is no REIT index portfolio. It's just some guy like picking out some cherry returns and going, seeking, this, would be, this is awesome. Well, Seeking Alpha just put together some of the top ones back in January, 2016. They decided to make a portfolio of... 10 small cap REITs, put them together. You really just, diversified. You just buy these 10 so that you've got, you've got those. And it's just, it's a, it's a compelling look at small caps. So he talks about the argument against small caps. And I thought this is a good way to just talk about small companies in general. The case against them is he says, you know how not everything that glitters is gold. Well, not everything that doesn't glitter is worthless. Are some small cap companies pointless and perhaps even downright dangerous? Of course, you'll get no argument from me there. By their very nature, these businesses can be less proven than I'd like. More often than not, they have the market caps they do because they haven't been around long enough. And in not being around long enough, they haven't made enough, nor have they established a long enough track record. I always got frustrated when clients would come in 
and would want to talk about buying into a business, OG, hey, I, I read about this business and they tell me the idea for the business and the idea sounds fantastic. But to Brad's point here, it's not about the idea. It's about executing on the yeah. idea. Show me the numbers. Show me the numbers. If a company is a small cap, either they haven't had time to develop it or B, the idea isn't as great as it sounds when they try to implement it. The argument for obviously is that you can get on the ground floor and you can be one of the first people in on some of these uh, fantastic investment opportunities. And the fact is because you're in early, the price is still really low. The price is not inflated. So even when compared to this year's earnings, uh, some small cap, small cap value funds, especially small cap value companies, the multiple that they trade at, and boy, I just opened up a can of worms by saying the word multiple. The multiple is very low. Yeah, but you have to think about, especially when you get to like really, really, really teeny tiny companies, like your friend's auto mechanic business, and he wants you to kick in some money because he needs to buy some stuff and you can be part of the business type of thing. That's kind of the same thing as buying a $50 million company that's not listed on a public exchange or whatever. Think about it like venture capitalists. These folks throw millions of dollars around knowing that 99 out of 100 of them are going to fail. And one of them is Apple or one of them is insert whatever company here. So if you're going to explore the individual ownership or partial ownership of really, really, really teeny tiny businesses, you got to understand that there's a really good chance you'll lose all of your money. It's more like I've got 10 million that isn't allocated toward the rest of my plan. And I'm going to give 20 companies, $500,000 and one of them. I mean, look at like the shark tank thing, right? When you see that on TV and those guys are buying $500,000 tranches of businesses, it's because they're like just throwing stuff against the wall to see what sticks. Yeah. And I think that's a lesson here. Small cap real estate certainly makes sense to me buying real property. That's small. I can see why it's ahead. It also in times when real estate downturns happen uh, could be, could be absolutely horrible. I wouldn't be surprised if you start looking at this small cap portfolio over a longer period of time than January 2016, that you'll see much more violent activity uh, well, sure. in terms of uh, volatility uh, than you will in much larger companies. But 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 I think that's, uh, you know, if you if you want small companies in your portfolio and if there's ever a, a small cap REIT portfolio that's that's developed, you're comfortable with real estate in your portfolio. I don't think that's a bad place to be. Sounds fun. I'm in. That may be lesson number one, but lesson number two is when you're building that portfolio, notice how I said, if you're comfortable with real estate, fits your goals, top 10 stocks that other millennials are buying means nothing to you. This guy has been on our show since the beginning. And usually we talk to him from a bunker deep under Los Angeles. I'm talking about the one and only Len Penzo. Hooray. Len, of course, has won a Plutus Award for the best single author blog, uh, lenpenzo.com. His blog is hilarious. He also has won a Plutus Award. They used to have an award for the funniest blog. And Len took home that one. He also has uh, garnered accolades from places like Kiplinger, CBS, Muddy Watch, and others. We're so happy he's here most every Friday on the show, but right now he's upstairs talking to mom. Here he comes. Let's say hi to our good friend, Len Penzo. And on his way down the stairs for his annual trip to the basement. I never Joe, see this how guy. How are you, my friend? Well, I feel like it's like the uh, groundhog. Did you see your shadow when you actually went outside? Uh, no, I'm too afraid to peek my head out. <laughs> so, well, you did to get here, and I'm glad that uh, you and mom had a few laughs before yes. we did this, as usual. Uh, she's always happy to see you, as you know, but she also knows that there's nobody who knows the cost of groceries like Len Penzo. So, so let's <laughs> let's dive in. Why did you, for people that are new to this, which is 
my favorite episode of the year, a lot of our listeners' favorite episode of the year. Why did you decide to start looking at the cost of a sandwich? Well, I mean, this went back a long time ago, Joe, back uh, when my kids were in school. The price of lunch, the school lunches, I thought were ridiculous and the food wasn't that great. The curiosity in me, just I needed to know exactly how much money I was saving on, a, you know, I would be saving on a brown bag lunch because you always hear that. Oh, brown bag lunch is cheaper than, a, you know, going out to eat or stuff like that. So I said, well, let's find out. And I wanted to track it on a yearly basis. And, and that's what got started. And this started this is 11th year, Joe. 11th so year. I can't believe I've been doing this that long. Well, and here's here's what I like about it, too, Len. This is a great way to look at inflation, you know, because I think a lot of people, when it comes to their investments, they don't really think about inflation. Yet, as something as banal as a as a school lunch, inflation's a real thing. <laughs> yeah. And it, you know what? And it shows up. You know, we were on the last four years prior to this previous year. The price of these sandwiches had been steadily dropping. But this year we saw a 7% increase in the average price of the 10 sandwiches that I survey. Wow. So yes, it's inf there's inflation, but it's not always inflation. Now, over the long term, if you look from the, my very first survey, the average price of a sandwich was 82 cents and we're up to $1 today. So yeah. what is that? 18 to 25% inflation. And really, over. well, yeah. And think about this Len. That's a really small decision. The average family doesn't even really think about multiply that by all the the high cost items that are in our life, this adds up secretly. It sure does. But I will say this, you know, you annualize it. It's probably 2% per year. Yes, it does add up. Uh, your rule of 72, I mean, prices will double at 2% inflation, what, every 35 years, 36 years, something like that. Not too bad at that rate. Yeah. No. And you say the average family with two kids spends, if they buy the school lunch, that's $1,000 a year that we can uh, cut from Horrible lunches sometimes. Yeah, that's my kids' school district. Now, my kids have both, they're out of high school now, so but I still keep track of it. The lunch at my kids' school district is $3. It's been that way for three years. Uh, if you take a 180-day school year, it's uh, $1,080 per child. So think about that, parents. You know, if you have two or three kids, that's, uh, what is that, $3,300 a year, right? Yeah, yeah, but that can be a bunch of money. Just on school lunches. Uh, so you go about this incredibly scientifically, like everything at <laughs> LenPenzo.com. You make sure that as many constants stay the same as possible. Tell me about your methodology here, because I think that's going to be important. Okay. Yeah. Um, and a matter of fact, I've just looked at this blog post is uh, 10 hours old, and I've already got a couple questions I haven't answered yet. People are asking about shrinkflation and all oh, that boy. stuff, and I haven't answered it. And this survey, what I do is I take all of the ingredients of the 10 – most common brown bag sandwiches. So I take all those ingredients, I take the serving sizes, and then I take a look at the cost of each of those items. Uh, just as a rule of thumb, I've always picked the cheapest item on the shelf. Let's say, for example, the peanut butter. It could be Jif one year, it could be Skippy. Usually it's none of those, though. It's, it's usually the store brand which is the cheapest, but that's the rule of thumb. If they, by chance, Skippy or Jif is cheaper that year than the store brand, that's the price I use. I take a look at the servings per container, and that way I keep a consistent price for that product from year to year to year to year. So I try to keep it as close as apples to apples as possible. You don't have to worry about shrinkflation or anything like that because <laughs> I'm, I'm, it's always per serving, cost per serving. And last year, just so people know what we had in 2018, bologna and peanut butter and jelly tied for first place as the uh, most economical sandwich. A cheese sandwich, which we got in trouble for. Remember a couple of years ago, somebody said we were advocating cheese sandwiches. I'm like, have you never heard of a grilled cheese sandwich? Exactly. Uh, but somebody said that it was borderline child abuse to serve your kid <laughs> cheese. And by the way, just so we're fair, we're advocating for none of these sandwiches. We, we, we're we letting the data show its own. I can't believe I have to say that. Uh, turkey and Swiss was in fourth. Egg salad was fifth. Ham and Swiss was sixth. That's a delicious sandwich, by the way. Salami was seventh. Tuna salad was eighth. Roast beef and cheddar, which is also a fine sandwich, was ninth. And the creme de la creme, the BLT, was tenth. So before we get into this year's rankings, Len... 
Let's talk about the individual ingredients. How did prices change? What, well, let's start off with this. What surprised you with the individual ingredients and how prices shifted from 12 months ago? Well, I think one of the big surprises was, and this is almost never happens. I have, let's see, total, I think almost 20 ingredients that I measure here individually. Uh, fully five of those ingredients, one quarter did not change at all in price. They dead flat, same price from the previous year. That's really unusual. Usually I might have one item, sometimes two, but uh, usually never more than that. The other thing I had is the items that did change in price, they either dropped very steeply or they increased very steeply. There were no kind of ingredients that were like only 2% difference. They were all double digit changes. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm looking, looking actually, t- yeah, tuna. Tuna was the tuna only one. Tuna was one. That's the one exception. Yeah, you caught me there, Joe. Uh, Joe. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Tuna was the only one. It, it dropped 4% in price from the previous year, but everything else was a double digit increase or decrease. Another strange, that's another unusual uh, thing. Yeah, either lots of fluctuation or none. Let's start off with the five that were the same from a year before. I want to look, first of all, at salami, because when we were talking about this a year ago, salami had one of the biggest, well, I take that back, it had the biggest price increase in 2018. And really, it stayed at zero, Len, by just holding on to those price gains from a year before. Yeah, that's true. And this year... uh, the price didn't budge this year, I don't think, did it? No, uh, no, the, that was that was one of your zeros. Was, yeah, that uh, was a zero. So the price didn't budge for the salami itself. However, the sandwich, the sandwich price did increase uh, ever so slightly, I believe, uh, as I'm looking here. 3%. Now, why is that? So if the price of salami didn't change, but the price of the sandwich went up, basically, here's the reason why. The price of bread this year went up 30%. Wow. Yeah. And now that's another strange thing. The price of bread was dropping. I think it dropped for five consecutive years. Um, and this year it went up 30 percent. So uh, and that was enough to move the price of the salami sandwich up three percent. Any reason why the price of bread is higher? I mean, is that I it? don't know. It's wheat. I use wheat bread as my benchmark. And I don't know. I, I would have to look at the wheat futures. I don't know if wheat, uh, you know, I should have looked before the show here. But uh, uh, my only guess is wheat futures uh, went up this year. Maybe they had a, a poor wheat crop or something. I don't know. Price, price of bread through the roof. Yeah. It, Takes a lot of bread to get that bread. <laughs> yeah, it's not good. Uh, cheese. Your cheeses were three of the other flatliners. So when it came to, yeah. to cheese, no no change there. It's really odd, Joe. I mean, that this almost never happens. But this year it did. Five items. And you're right. All three of the cheeses in the survey, American, Swiss, and cheddar, they did not, on a cost per serving basis, the price did not change. The biggest drop of all for a while Turkey a few years ago, I remember you and I meeting and the price of Turkey was way up, but a 43% drop. Yeah. Tremendous drop uh, in the price of, of Turkey. And, and I got to say Turkey sandwiches in 2015. So what is that? Four years ago, the price of a Turkey sandwich was a buck 44 in my survey. Uh, since then, the price has fallen 65% wow. either because Turkey prices have come down or Swiss cheese prices have come down. But over that time, 65% drop. So now a turkey sandwich in the survey is just 51 cents. Now think about this. The American cheese sandwich this year was 50 cents. Right. So, yeah. So so if you want a grilled cheese sandwich, for another penny, you can make a nice turkey in Swiss. And as that reviewer said, American cheese sandwich is child abuse. So for one penny more... (laughs) One penny more, you don't abuse your kid. Yeah, your kid will be be stoked. <laughs> You'll only be spending a penny more a sandwich. That's so great. Next, I want to look at another one that dropped, jelly. Jelly down 30%. Yeah, yeah jelly. You've seen the comments over the past years through and through. People always <laughs> picking my survey choices. I selected strawberry jam, basically. That's what I picked 11 years ago or to start this survey, and that's what I go with. And the price what this is year it, of the is strawberry the, jam fell thirty-two uh, percent. Not to cut you off, but is it the grape association that's after you? <laughs> yeah, uh, last year's remember I got taken to there was a couple ladies that actually said, well, "Who puts strawberry jam on a peanut butter sandwich?" Said, well, I do. Oh, hello, I love strawberry. Me too. <laughs> I prefer strawberry. To, that's why I pick it. It's my survey. You know, you, you want your own survey. Go. And you know what? I, I don't know what the difference is. I'll be honest. I don't know if, how much difference there is between grape and 
strawberry. It could be a lot. I have no idea. And I'm wondering if it is just jellies in general, because I noticed that in my diet, and I don't know if it has to do with my age or whatever, but I feel like there's been just a ton of media about sugar the past few years. And it seems like, man, when you have a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, you're just loading up the sugar content. I guess, but they're so good. They I are. mean, I, who doesn't like PB and J? I'm, I'm, I'm with you, brother. I'm, I, <laughs> I got your back on that one. Uh, and let's talk about that if we can. Yeah. So the price of the PB and J went up three percent this year, despite strawberry jam or jelly dropping thirty two percent, and that's because the price of peanut butter was up eighteen percent. So they kind of canceled each other out. You can't win. You can't. You can't win. Uh, let's talk about things that are up. You said peanut butter was up 18%, bacon up 20 That's horrible. Uh, but roast beef, the big loser here, up 33%. Yeah, and again, I, I maybe I should have been looking at beef futures. I, I have no uh, cattle futures. I, I you know, I, maybe there's a they had a poor uh, cattle harvest. Well, that's a continuing trend too, though, isn't it? Because just, you know, you look at steaks and steak restaurants. I know that steak's getting more and more expensive over time. Beef just in general getting more and more expensive over time. Yeah. And you know where I see that? If I can talk about my favorite restaurant, Joe, Benihana. The price of my favorite meal at Benihana, the, the land and sea, it just keeps going up and up and up and up. It's yeah. those steak prices. Reflected, reflected right there. And by yeah. the way, the roast beef and cheddar, not an inexpensive sandwich. We said earlier that last year that was number nine. And just to give you an idea of this year, it's still number nine. Uh, that's a dollar sixty a sandwich. Yeah, so it went up significantly. It went up 24% this year. It was actually quite a deal last year. It was um, – you know, closer to a dollar twenty four, I think, last year, which is just incredible That's for roast right. beef and cheddar. Yeah, I remember so. that. D dive in on that, but but uh, mayonnaise stayed the same, and the cheese stayed the same. So it was just the price of roast beef and bread that brought it up the yep. most. Yep. Yeah. Let me bring up one more thing. So I, I know uh -huh. there's people saying, "Well, how do you make your sandwiches, Lynn?" It's like, look, I try to keep it simple. You know, I know a lot of people, and me included, I like putting lettuce and tomato on all my sandwiches, except the PB and J, of course, but. In the survey, I only use lettuce and tomato on the BLT sandwich. Otherwise, I don't include the, in these prices the cost of lettuce and tomato on, say, a bologna sandwich or a turkey sandwich, like the, that turkey and Swiss. I would put the lettuce and tomato on, but I don't include it here. In my survey, though, it's very easy to see just because I have everything broken out by ingredients. You can look at the price. A serving of lettuce, which I use as two leaps of lettuce – and a half a tomato, the price of that combined is $1.30. So if you want to add, say, for example, your turkey and Swiss, I said it's uh, 51 cents. If you want to add the lettuce and tomato, add $1.30 to that, it's $1.80. Then it's $1.80 for that same sandwich. And there it is. Kids going to lunch with the most fantastic sandwich ever. <laughs> Maybe not saving money, but the kid giggles all the way through. Oh, recess. my gosh. Yeah. I don't know how many kids will eat a sandwich with lettuce and tomato on it. Though. Probably not. Good point. That's, <laughs> that's, that's an acquired taste. Yes. Yes. But speaking of tomatoes and lettuce, your vegetables on the sandwiches, Len, those both went up in price. Yeah. The lettuce went up 31 cents. Yeah. And lettuce is always a wild card. It all comes down to your local harvest, basically. But uh, out here where I am in California, must have been a poor harvest because uh, the price went up 31 percent. The price of the tomatoes went up 13 percent. Let's go through them then in order. I think we did a nice survey of the different condiments and different pieces of the sandwiches. Coming in at number 10, the most expensive again, but still maybe the best sandwich on the list is the BLT. The BLT. That's 10 out of 11 years that it has been, not surprisingly, the most expensive sandwich. Let's keep one thing in perspective, Joe. A Big Mac is $3.99 at most McDonald's. So uh, you can get a, a BLT 317 assembled by yourself. Yeah, but I don't have a teenager putting it together for me. <laughs> <laughs> the cost of that is valuable. <laughs> but you know, if my son was putting it together, he'd put 12 pieces of bacon and, and uh, a whole tomato and a head of lettuce. <laughs> I, I've been known, been known to do that myself, but we'll stick with your numbers. Number nine, uh, and by the way, that that is an increase of 18% from last year. Number nine, up 24% in price since last year is? Roast beef and cheddar. But still not the most expensive it's been since you started your uh, survey. 
No, it actually was pushing two bucks about five years ago, six years ago. And so what, it's only a dollar sixty today. In eighth place, one that was really expensive. Talking about a few years ago, this one was way expensive. In fact, there were, I think, uh, I'm not sure. It might have been the most expensive for a year or two. Is uh, this one? You may. I, you are correct. One, the one year BLT wasn't the most expensive. It was the tuna salad sandwich. And I don't know what has happened, but in the last three years, the price of tuna, and I use albacore tuna in my survey, has dropped precipitously. I mean, it. these sandwiches were pushing two well, – where they were over $2 five, six, seven years ago, eight years ago. And now they're dollar three this year. Yeah. That's far less than half the price they were a few years – you know, five years ago, four years ago. So if you're buying low, the lesson here is eat tuna salad sandwiches every meal while it's low. Yes. The other thing you might want to know is, hey, you don't know if the price of tuna is going to go back up. I really don't know what's driving the lower costs of albacore tuna. But, uh, you know, now's your chance to really enjoy the tuna salad. It's a it's a bargain. Seventh place. And this one has been surging up lately is salami. Yeah. Salami's misbehaving. It's going up in price. I don't know why. Uh, It's still a bargain. It's only a buck. It's at the average of all of our sandwiches. So, uh you know, not bad. It went up 3% this year. And as I said, that's only because the price of bread went up 30%. I don't love salami sandwiches though. Do you? Uh, I like hard. And, and that's what I use in my survey is the dry, hard salami, not the soft salami that you can get. Uh, Cause I've gotten these letters to emails. Uh, hey, Penzo, you know, I can get salami for, you know, <laughs> you know, I'll, I'll 28 slices for 55 cents. It's like, yeah, but that's the soft salami. It's really bologna. And they just put some special – it's not true salami. My survey, it's the true hard dry salami. I love people debating sandwiches with you. <laughs> it's like somebody needs a hobby. Yep. Next up, number six. Ham and Swiss. 86 cents and uh, cheaper than last year. Yep. That's another one of those sandwiches. We already discussed this, but it's been dropping precipitously over the last five years. Yeah. Uh, number five. Egg salad. Egg salad all over the map. Yep. Egg salad, by the way, down 4%. Number four. Turkey and Swiss. Delicious. Just delicious. Another one, by the way, that if you want to, if you want to buy low, eat a bunch of turkey and Swiss right now. Number three. Okay, people. It's the American cheese. We'll call it grilled cheese, however you want it, but it's uh, a <laughs> cheese sandwich. That grid kind of looks like a flat line, that graph on your blog post. Yep. It's been pretty consistent. The top three have really been consistently cheap, and they've juggled positions, the top spot, over the whole life of the survey. So that leaves the two that were tied, bologna and peanut butter and jelly. Who's number one? The bologna sandwich wins the prize. It is the seventh consecutive year that it's either tied or been the cheapest sandwich. I still have 34 it. cents, 34 cents, a sandwich, 34 cents set in the standard. And what happened to PB and J? It went up three cents. And uh, that's I guess we'll blame it on peanut butter because the price of peanut butter went up 18 percent. Well, and bread, right? So and bread, but yeah. bread's on all the sandwiches. That's true. So Good it's, point. That's a, it's a wash. Constant. So, you know, it's interesting. The thing about bologna, too, that's uh, the sales tend to go up in. Uh, and I think I brought this up before in these shows, but it's interesting. People think of bologna as being a very expensive meat. Oh, it's twenty, you know, it's six dollars a pence more expensive than filet mignon. It is actually serving per serving. It's relatively cheap and it sales tend to go up in recessionary periods. Let's talk about a couple things here uh, before we say goodbye, Len. A couple things just more broadly about about school lunches. Number one, you have done in other surveys, not this one, comparisons of store brands versus the, you know, the big name brands. And what did you yep. find there? Oh, not surprisingly, the store brands are, (laughs) they're usually cheaper. Not always. There are some, there are rare exceptions when the store brands are not cheaper, but they are usually cheaper. And many, many times they're just as good or better than the store, store bought as my family surveys. And Joe, I know you, you just mentioned them, but uh, I have my family surveys that I do here on the blog and my family can't even tell the difference. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. And, And a lot of times they choose it like is the best one. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. And then the second thing is rounding out the lunch beyond the sandwich doesn't have to be expensive either. No. For example, a little bag of chips, a juice box, 
and say a banana or some carrot sticks, usually you can get all three of those for a, a buck to a buck and a quarter. If you buy in bulk, you know, those bag of chips or a bunch of bananas or, you know, the things of carrot sticks, you put all that together in your lunch and it's maybe a buck to a buck and a quarter. So add that plus your peanut butter and jelly sandwich and, you know, dollar seven, you're under two bucks, less than two bucks. You've got a brown, a nice brown bag lunch. Lots of takeaways here. We'll link to it in our show notes at stackybenjamins.com. As always, Len, phenomenal work. I love this study. <laughs> Thanks, Joe. Hey there, trivia fans. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. And all that talk of sandwiches has me a tad peckish. To show that I can withstand the withering pain of not eating for 84 consecutive minutes while still talking about it, check out this question. Which of the 10 sandwiches on Len's survey used to be considered a delicacy? I'll be back with the second half of this question as soon as I go maybe make myself a cheese sandwich and stare at it because I'm a machine, baby. We were talking about real estate earlier in the show, OG, and a real estate investment that I've been a fan of for a while is called Acre Trader. They are based in Northwest Arkansas, the area where my daughter went to school. In fact, their offices are not far from the University of Arkansas, and they work extensively, I know, with people there in the agricultural department, uh, which is right at the corner of America's breadbasket. So these people know farmland. And when it comes to farmland, the reason I like farmland is because I grew up in farmland myself in southwest Michigan, worked in cornfields and wheat fields and rye fields, soybeans. Name a field in southwest Michigan. You probably found some field you were in. <laughs> probably found my brother, my cousin, I there. So I'm not telling you that it's a good idea to be a farmer if you know nothing about farming. However, I do know this farmland historically has appreciated more slowly, but also depreciated more slowly in times of downturn than other types of real estate. It is boring, OG, and boring for the right investor could be a good thing. The second thing I know is that you don't have to be a farmer. You're just a landlord. Instead of having to have a lot of money to purchase a whole field, the reason, by the way, I never talked about this when I was a financial advisor was specifically that reason. You'd have to tie up a lot of money in one field. Now what Acre Trader does is takes your money and puts it together with a lot of other people's money and they subdivide the field and you own a little piece of that field. And so now you are a micro owner of it and Acre Trader takes care of everything. They make sure there's a farmer working that field. They work on soil sustainability. So every year that field's ready to go. They collect the rent every year before the farmer puts his crop in so that you get a yearly income stream from that field. And then, and here's the reason why it's only available to accredited investors is your money is locked up though until they sell the field. So do not put a bunch of money into anything that's locked up for a long period of time, like a piece of farmland is. However, if you are an accredited investor looking for an income stream and a nice, boring, in my mind, in a good way, boring rate of return, check out acretrader.com forward slash SB. That's acretrader.com forward slash SB. They have a video there that explains it all and use our link to tell them that uh, Stacking Benjamins sent you. Welcome back, trivia fans. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and bam! Did you know that you can grill these cheese sandwiches? <laughs> I know Len and Joe mentioned it, but I thought they were totally joking. Then Joe's mom goes and lays that knowledge bomb on me and then drops one in front of me with a glass of milk. <laughs> Hello, people! I haven't felt this good since that time I accidentally spilled Crisco all over myself, but... Here's the answer to your trivia. Which of the 10 sandwiches in Len's survey was considered a delicacy back in the day? If you answered peanut butter and jelly. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> oh, that's really the answer? Wow. According to the sheet of paper in front of me, peanut butter and jelly were considered a delicacy only enjoyed by the upper crust of society because they were both 
difficult to get. The peanut butter and jelly, not the upper crust people. Go ahead and show off to your friends by sharing that little morsel with them. Kinda like I just shared this amazing pile of trivia with you. See ya. Bam, you got that one. Winner, winner. Sandwich dinner. Big thanks to Len Penzo for stopping by. I love talking to him this way about inflation. As you know, OG, inflation is the one thing that people always overlook. It's so boring. And yet prices over time continue to go up. Just continue to rise. It happens. Yeah. I could tell the old guy stories. I remember when I remember my gas was 73 cents a gallon. Remember that? I totally remember that. Gas stalled at a dollar forever, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. Gall- 99. Remember I cracked a dollar? Like, no. What? And then almost immediately it was a dollar 25. Bam. Yeah. And then it came back down to it. Well, we don't need to go into that. But anyways. And then it went to a dollar one. And then it was 99 cents again. I remember and then it went that. to a dollar 19. Or was a oh. dollar 19 hung out for a while? Oh, then it was that day. Yeah. No, but then seriously, then the Gulf War happened. Remember? And bam. Gas then shot to well, the <laughs> As I was driving after the initial Gulf War, oh, I still got gas at 73 cents. Well. That's where I remember. Well, kiddo. <laughs> Let me tell you something. Let me tell you about the Red gold. was a nickel. Let me tell you about the golden age of gasoline. The days when there was a band called Duran Duran. <laughs> hey, let's uh, throw out the Haven Lifeline and tackle some of life's most important questions. Our friends at Haven Life Insurance Agency, they put what you value first. Sometimes I like a really... Just sloppy Italian sandwich. So I'm going to go with Italian sandwiches now. I am big now on any sandwich that has coleslaw on it. <laughs> and, I, <laughs> and I know when I'm stepping in there. Please don't email me. Yeah. I love it. Uh, yeah, those like are good. Like a Reuben. Oh. Like a turkey Reuben. I haven't had a turkey mm. Reuben in forever. I don't like regular Reubens, but turkey Reuben. That sounds good. so good. Uh, it's your loved ones and your time. But if you could have your loved ones, your time, and a turkey Reuben, I'm in. It's why they made buying quality term life insurance actually simple. Here's what you do. You head to stackybenjamins.com forward slash Haven Life now, and you're going to get a free quote. Their application is simple. It's online, and you get an instant coverage decision. I absolutely love how they've taken something that used to be long and slow and difficult and made it super duper duper easy. It's funny. I was uh, listening to Sirius XM yesterday on a road trip that was about an hour and a half long. And I kept hearing commercials for another company that I'd never heard of before talking about, well, we're the company that made it really easy. Yeah, you're not. Yeah. You, you are brand new Haven life been around before you just saying, uh, today, actually, we don't have a question. We're going to throw out Haven lifeline to a lot of different people today because we got a great email last week from Emily after a discussion a couple weeks ago, with our friend Bola. Remember Bola from Clever Girl Finance? Yeah. And Bola was talking about how her dad handled everything with the family's money and really didn't want mom involved. Mom decided she was going to take it upon herself, began setting money aside. And when dad lost his job earlier than expected, mom's money was there. And having both people involved was fantastic. That discussion with Bola, by the way, OG, spurred a lot of discussions that I really appreciated. But this letter from Emily, I think is an important one, OG, that you and I should definitely address. Emily says, love the show, wanted to point out something that's been bothering me. In the past couple of weeks, you mentioned a few times how important it is for both parts of a couple to be involved in the finances. Once regarding an article where the wife was not aware of the money they had. Then when you spoke about Bola's mother, while I agree with this sentiment, I feel it's important to point out that in both those cases, it was the woman who was left out of the finances. And in fact, this is often consciously done by the spouse as a form of financial abuse. The first example especially raised many red flags that this woman was probably being intentionally deceived by her husband regarding their finances. I don't want to suggest this is always the case. Certainly, there are plenty of partnerships where one person willingly takes a back seat. I just wanted to present another perspective, especially since I think it applies to some of the examples you've mentioned on the show. Thank you for reading and putting out great shows to get me through the week. Hoping to learn something soon, Emily. Hey, thanks for that, Emily. And I think, OG, that frankly is a line because I'm not in that type of relationship. You're not in that type of relationship. 
people like you and I are usually dealing with individuals or couples that are trying to get ahead. So they're not in this relationship, but I've seen it in the press. You've seen it before. I have a friend who's a psychologist who said she sees this sadly fairly often where one spouse says, no, it's too complicated or it's just a way to beat down your spouse. And it's just horrible. If you're in that type of relationship, this stuff isn't hard. And I'm glad that you're listening to this show because uh, while you won't learn anything here, at the very least, it's great surround sound and uh, and planning is not difficult. If somebody's telling you it is, uh, you got to get away from that. Yeah, I don't have much to add there. I mean, I think if you are working together on goals, you're more likely to to reach them. It's unfair if you've got this idea in your mind of what you're trying to get to, but you don't get to see the scorecard because it's quote too complicated or whatever the case may be. Right. So how do you know, how do you know if you're winning the game? You know, there's never a scoreboard. How would we cheer for the team that we want to have win? You know what I mean? So I think it's really important that everybody's on the same page. This is kind of why I'm not a real big fan of the, this is my money and this is his money and this is our money thing. Because when you do that, you end up with like this really loosey goosey accountability, you know, and then if one person's, you know, trying to row the boat in one direction and the other person's shoveling water in the boat, there's not. Well, and if somebody's really trying to, and if somebody's trying to hide something makes it very easy to oh, hide when you're, easy. when you're trying yeah. to be deceptive from your spouse, you know, um, our friend Farnoosh Tarabi over at So Money uh, podcast and I have had this conversation before because she and I both have relationships where our spouse and I have different accounts. However, we both use apps where everything's on the table. You can see exactly how the other person's spending money. It's completely open. We also both check our credit regularly. So if there's any credit thing going on with either Cheryl or I on my end or Farnoosh and her husband on their end, you can see that right away. So we look at all this stuff together and those family meetings where you're working on your stuff together also helps ensure that that won't happen. But certainly if, if you suspect that a spouse, a loved one, whoever you're planning with is hiding stuff from you, credit reports, a great place to look first. Yeah. Bank account statements. I mean, you got to go through it all, but um, it's sucky if that's the situation you're in. I'm glad Emily brought this up because even Cheryl and I have talked about this in the past that I don't know. Oh, gee, when you work with people all the time and you you're surrounded all the time with people who are just trying to get ahead and not cheat other people, not scam other people, not abuse other people. It gets easy to think that 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 stuff doesn't happen. So, Emily, I'm I'm so glad you wrote with that point. You have to get out of those relationships. You have to. This is not difficult. It isn't your fault. And you're not too stupid to understand money. So that was slightly more serious OG than we normally have on the show. But thanks for the question, Emily. If you've got a question for the show or a note, head to stackybedjamins.com forward slash voicemail. That's going to do it for today. What a great show. Hey, thanks to everybody who helped us make this happen today. Doug's going to have all of that later. Thanks to you for hanging out with us. And thanks to anybody who's left a review of this show to tell everybody just how awesome the greatest money show on earth circus is. And finally, if you're someone who's looking for good financial help in your corner, OG and his team are taking clients. So head to stackybedjamins.com forward slash OG for more on that. All right. That's going to do it for today. Doug, you got it from here, man. What should we have learned on today's show? Yep. Sure thing, Joe. I got it. First, take some advice from Len Penzo. That work or school lunch, it may be way less expensive and more nutritious to pack your sandwich. Even at BLT levels, you're usually saving money. Second, A stock you can't live without. What you can't live without is a plan. Stocks are picked based on your goals, not based on what your brother-in-law's bowling buddy's sister's stockbroker thinks is the next hot thing. Come on. But the big lesson? Thanks to Len, I can find out which is the cheapest sandwich each year. Now that's my jam. My jam. 
That's my jam. Oh, come on, people. How thick are you? Not as thick as my jam. Now that's funny. Special thanks to Len Penzo for joining us today. You can find out more about Len and his annual sandwich survey at lenpenzo.com. This show was created by Joe Saul Cihai, produced by Richie Rutter Reese, and engineered by the amazing Steve Stewart. Online, visit us on Twitter at at SBenjamin'sCast or on our Facebook page. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and I swear the worst part about coming over to Joe's mom's house is having to put on pants. SB Podcasts may receive payment on the show from sponsors and guests in the form of books, giveaway items, discounts, or other remuneration. There's no way you would take advice from these dorks, but like Joe's mom always says, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only, and before making any financial moves, consult with a real financial advisor. quick after show today that road trip that i was on was to uh, was to go to michigan international speedway the race that my dad and i went to earlier this year and by the way big shout out again to kevin kidd who came on the show uh, a couple months ago and walked us through how teamwork works in the pits of a nascar team and uh, we did not by the way reach out to kevin this time he's got a job to do his teams are in some important races and uh, we just went and sat in the stands, but Kevin, we wore our Roush hats. So big shout You're out rep- to repping the threads. We were repping the threads. So big shout out to Roush racing and uh, our friend, Kevin kid, the competition director over there. But anyway, so we go out there and we hung out, we took some health food, you know, hot dogs, <laughs> beer, yeah. that type of stuff. And got the headset again. And and I have to tell you, listening to the way these teams work together. And it's funny because with some of the teams, there's a driver named Jimmy Johnson, who a lot of you've probably heard of. Jimmy has had a frustrating couple of years. He hasn't won a race in two years. He's riding along right in, I mean, I think he's in fourth or fifth place in a field of 38 cars. So he's up near the front. And all of a sudden he comes around a turn and just smacks a wall hard. And his team immediately goes from, Hey, we're in this to win it race to we're trying to patch this up and get on the road. And it's funny, OG, how many financial planning analogies there are there where, where something comes at you out of the blue. And you could see, by the way, in Jimmy's case, the contingency plan just roll out immediately The crew chief is on the radio. We're going to do this. We're going to do this. We're going to do this. And you could see it's from a pre-designed checklist. But these guys, they don't have unlimited time to make changes. They they don't have, they don't have, have all week, all year to make this thing happen. And yet they still are able to duct tape it. And uh, it it ended up being a horrible race for them. But uh, watching this team go into contingency mode just made me think about how often people don't have that and how important it is that we continue to talk about contingency planning. And you got to think about those contingency plans before, right. You know, you get into it, you got to have it on the shelf so you can execute it. Yeah. You can't go, Oh, Jimmy just hit the wall. What do we do? Right. Yeah. Can't do that. The, the, the second thing way, way funnier I'm finding out that when you buy a $5,000 car, random stuff happens. A couple <laughs> things. The last time we were at the NASCAR track, I started my car remotely. 
I didn't know my car had the ability to do that. Nice. So, yeah. So, so I'm helping put the camper up and uh, pressed on my pocket accidentally and my car fired up. And I don't know which button I pressed, but I can't replicate that. The other thing that happened this time is we're sitting, you know, we got our little Coleman stove out there. We've got our chairs. We're hanging out, waiting for the race to start, having our pregame tailgate. All of a sudden, my car alarm starts going off for no apparent reason. Dude's one car down. Look over and stare at me. <laughs> like, what the hell are you doing? So I look right back at them. Big smile on my face because I have no idea why the hell my alarm went off. I paid five grand for this car. I have no idea how any of this stuff works wh or why. Wh why? Why? I've been sitting here for 20 minutes. My car alarm goes off for no reason. And uh, I look at those guys and I just said, hey, I'm stealing this car. So I'll let you know I'm stealing this car. And they didn't even crack a smile. Just because they thought you were serious. Oh, yeah. Like, yeah, because I'm sitting in a chair with a beer open. Hey, I'm stealing this car. Just wanted to let you know. I'm not an expert, but I think it's probably because you sat on a button. Did you press the buttons on your on your key fob? I have no idea what happened. Just to I mean, to experiment. I, I would go on your driveway, maybe maybe run a little experiment. Like if I press this button, this happens. If I press this button, and let me, you can label them. You get a little label maker, like all the old people do, and like label each button. This is the oh this the go button. This is the stop button. This is the honking button. Do you want to tell everybody? Button down. Do you want to tell everybody which finger I'm showing you right now? It's. I'm giving you a salute. Not, Thank uh, you. Yeah. It's very nice. Very very helpful. Thank you.